Hello, uh, this lecture is going to discuss Tennessee Williams in reference to a streetcar named Desire, which we are going over in class in for the next few weeks. Uh, Tennessee Williams was born in 1911 and lived just about 72 years and died in 1983. His original name was Thomas Lanier Williams III. He was born in Mississippi. His father was an alcoholic who worked as a shoe salesman. And when I say that, I don't want you to think of Al Bundy um, putting on shoes for women. He was more um, of a managerial type. Um, his mother acted like she was from the upper classes, acting snobbishly to others, and had a very puritanical streak about sex. Um, apparently, in many interviews, Tennessee Williams recounts um, stories of his mother uh, literally freaking out when her a husband, Tennessee Williams' father, um, wanted to have sex with her. She would run around the house screaming. Anyway, um, somewhere around the ages of seven or eight, he developed diphtheria, um, which gave him problems with his mobility. Um, he spent six months in bed and then another six months to a year recovering. Um, as such, he was pulled out of that world of being a rambunctious young boy and into the world of solitary activities like reading and writing. Um, and he often, uh, in interviews, recounts that, you know, that was when his entire life changed um, because he had to entertain himself. When he got to college, he ultimately adopted his fraternity nickname as his writing name, which was Tennessee. Um, there's another story out there that says that he actually took the name Tennessee for his writing name um, as uh, a mini homage to his grandfather who had been born in Tennessee. But um, in terms of what stories you hear, the college story tends to be the one that's most popular. Now. <clears throat> the thing with Tennessee Williams is that his inspiration was his family. Um, his father, like I said, had been an alcoholic. He was also abusive, angry, violent. Um, his mother was overbearing and smothering. And again, remember, she had that puritanical streak about sex. Um, his mother was um, in the is in the picture on the top right with his older sister Rose and he is the cute little munchkin on the right. Uh, his sister Rose was a paranoid schizophrenic which means that she had delusions and hallucinations both auditory and visual um, and her mother Tennessee Williams mother opted to have her go through a prefrontal lobotomy and basically what that means is in those days they would use a instrument that looked a lot like knitting needles and they would go up through your nasal cavity into the brain matter of your front part of your brain and basically scramble it so that um, your emotional center was numbed and it essentially turned her into a um, very docile person and that was the whole point of a prefrontal lobotomy was to take unruly patients and calm them down so to speak the unfortunate consequences that once a person is given this prefrontal lobotomy at least this was the scenario back in the 50, 40s 30s 20s you know when the procedure first came out was that she was incapacitated and um, she had to live in an asylum for the rest of her life. Um, Tennessee Williams, again, tells some very entertaining stories, sad but entertaining stories about how she would get fixated on things like soap and toilet paper. And when he took her to visit friends, she would go into the restroom and take all of the soap and toilet paper and shove it in her bag. So just little weird ticks. Um, she is the model for many of his mad, and that's in quotations, female characters. Um, the insanity, the, the craziness that society oftentimes imposes on a person. 
He also paid for her care for the rest of their lives. Um, when he started making money, he had her moved from a state asylum to a very nice resting home um, in New York. And again, you know, when he died, he left his his estate to Rose. And so when she died, uh, approximately 15 years after he did, um, the estate was worth $7 million. So it was a very compassionate perspective on his part. Now, at college, Tennessee Williams did okay until his junior year when he failed a course, and it was a military training course. So his father took him out of school and forced him to become a clerk at the shoe company. And this was something that he sucked up and did for a few years, but when he was 24, he suffered a nervous breakdown and left the job. He then went to um, a couple of colleges when he finally ended up at the University of Iowa, where he completed his degree in English. In 1939, he moved to New Orleans, and at this point, his writing started to get noticed. In 1944, his first play that gained national attention, which was The Glass Menagerie, had their opening previews in Chicago, and by the time they moved to New York, um, it had literally sold out in advance for almost four months. Um, his next play, which is the one we're going to be focusing on in the class, is Streetcar Named Desire, and that opened in 1947 to even higher acclaim. Um, since then, in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, the drama critics of America have pointed to Streetcar Named Desire as the best play written in the 20th century. So uh, it's an extremely interesting play, and it is provocative and symbolic and all of those wonderful things that literary people love. <coughs> Now, Williams also had his own issues, because you can't grow up in a crazy household without having a few problems of your own. So, he suffered from debilitating bouts of depression, and again, remember, this is the days before things like Prozac and Zoloft and Wellbutrin. So, he treated his depression using alcohol and prescription medications. In the 1960s, um, a guy who was known by the um, celebrities as Dr. Feelgood took over his medicinal regime and basically was giving him vitamin shots most mornings. Well, those vitamin shots were actually amphetamines, speed. And for him to calm down later in the day, he would drink himself into essentially an alcoholic coma to sleep at night. So this became an ongoing issue through the late 60s, 70s, and um, in the early 80s before he died. Now his love life is also one that was um, exceedingly rare, which was that he was not only gay, but he was openly gay at a time when being gay could put you, put you in prison. He enjoyed a long-term relationship with a gentleman by the name of Frank Merlot, who is in both pictures on the right. He is the gentleman in the top picture in the striped shirt, and in the bottom picture, he is the gentleman all the way to the left. Um, he is ex-Navy. He had that rough masculinity that Tennessee Williams enjoyed. And uh, Tennessee Williams is in both pictures. He's in the white shirt in the top. And he is the second guy from the right in the bottom shot. This time period with Frank Merlot was his most productive and most successful. So this is the time period that Tennessee Williams was his, I guess, happiest. He's often said it was the time he was the most happiest. And, you know, clearly when a person is happy in their personal life, they can devote more attention to their um, creative or professional life. He won the Pulitzer Prize for Streetcar in 1948, so this was a very good time for him. Merlot died in 1963 from cancer, and so for the next 20 years, Tennessee Williams, he didn't have such a great time period. He wasn't really putting out a lot of plays or stories that were met with critical acclaim, like I said, he had been using more and more drugs and alcohol, 
And essentially, by the time he got into the late 1970s, early 80s, a lot of people saw him as no longer relevant. Um, In 1983, he died in a really freak accident. Um, He put a bottle cap in his mouth when putting in eye drops, something that a lot of us do, and the cap slipped down his throat and choked him to death. Um, Now, that was what the coroner said, um, but the rumor has been that he actually died of a drug and alcohol overdose, but it was covered up to protect what was left of his reputation. And the picture of him on the right is him in the 70s. So, you know, he didn't really change too much physically over his lifetime, but um, certainly you can point to the death of Frank Merlot as the beginning of the end for Tennessee Williams' creative period. So let's look at his legacy. Um, he was a f- he was awarded four Drama Critic Circle awards, two Pulitzer prizes, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. More importantly, he was also condemned by the Catholic Church as being offensive to decency. So it's pretty much the trifecta plus a bonus from the Catholic Church because as soon as somebody says that you're obscene, people will get much more interested in you. Now, as we go over the information in Streetcar Named Desire, you're going to be looking at certain themes that ran through a lot of Tennessee Williams' writing. Um, There is this overt masculinity and aggression in a lot of his male characters. Um, Sexuality is really on display um, front and center, which hadn't been done before. Um, Madness, meaning insanity. The blending of truth and fiction in terms of, you know, what is true? Everybody has a different perspective on truth. And Tennessee Williams allows the elasticity of memory to um, divide our senses into, is it true or is it just true for them? The romantic quest for a soulmate, cruelty to those who are least able to defend themselves, self-sabotage, hidden addictions, and the attempt to reinvent the past to define the future. And again, we get into this idea of memory being elastic, that the way I remember something may not be the way you remember something, because we all have filters in which we perceive things. So, if you have any questions, please feel free to text or email me. Otherwise, have a lovely day, and I hope you enjoy Streetcar Named Desire. Thank you.